All right, engineers, we're gonna talk about EKGs. So before I get into all of these abnormal EKGs, because we're gonna talk about each one of these in a little bit of detail, we'll go over them in much, much more detail whenever we get into pathophysiology. For right now, I wanna take a look at just a basic EKG. Another thing that we'll look at in future videos is we'll go over the 12 lead system. So we'll go over the three bipolar limb leads, the three augmented unipolar limb leads, and the six chest leads. But for right now, we're gonna just take a basic look at an EKG and then some common abnormalities. First things first, so if we look at here at the EKG, we have three distinguishable waves, right? This first one right here, we refer to this wave as the P wave. All right, so this is our P wave. So P wave is this positive deflection from that isoelectric line, right? So we have that positive deflection. Then you might see this little negative deflection right there. That's your QRS wave. So we have our QRS wave. And then this last wave over here with this other positive deflection is the T wave. Now let's talk about each one of these waves, what they are designed to, what they specify. So first off, let's go over here to P wave. P wave. So the P wave tells us that the atria are depolarizing. In other words, whenever the atria, so you start off with the SA node, the SA node fires those impulses throughout the entire internodal pathway and Bachmann's bundle, and it reaches the AV node. What happens is once it reaches the AV node, the atria depolarize and they contract, they undergo systole. But that electrical activity that shows up on here on the EKG with this positive deflection point is designed to tell us that there is atrial depolarization. And again, we already know what depolarization means. It means that the inside of the cell is becoming more positive. It's conducting action potentials, right? This next one over here is the QRS wave. So we have the QRS wave over here. Now the QRS wave is obviously this big negative, positive, negative deflection. And this represents ventricular depolarization. So it does represent ventricular depolarization. And what that means is that whenever those impulses from the AV node, they reach the AV node, there's a 0.1 second delay that we talked about in the cardiac cycle. It sends those impulses down through the ventricles, down the AV bundle, right and left bundle branches, Purkinje fibers, and as it's moving around those guys, it's causing the ventricles to become depolarized. In other words, the inside of their membranes are becoming more positive. And then eventually that will trigger ventricular contraction, which we talked about in the cardiac cycle. So again, that's ventricular depolarization. Another interesting thing is cells need to go through a relaxation period. So they need to depolarize and then they need to repolarize so they can be excited again. So if you notice, we didn't mention here, where's atrial repolarization? Well, atrial repolarization is hidden or masked within this QRS complex. So we can technically say within the QRS wave, there is a hidden or masked atrial repolarization occurring. So let's write that down here. Atrial repolarization is occurring. There's atrial repolarization and ventricular depolarization occurring within this QRS wave. And again, you can't see the atrial repolarization because it's masked by this positive negative deflection points within the QRS wave. Next one is gonna be the T wave. And the T wave is what signifies the ventricular, the ventricles repolarizing. So after they've all contracted, they have to go into the refractory period so that they can actually get all the oxygen to the tissues because that's when the coronary circulation is filling. And once it starts doing that, it has to repolarize and then get ready to be excited again. So we say the T wave is representing ventricular repolarization, okay? So now that we have a basic concept or an understanding of what all this just basic EKG tells us, now we can take a look at some of these common abnormalities within the ECGs. Like I said, we're gonna get into these in more detail when we get into pathophysiology. Just a brief overview of some of these. 
So if you look here, we have a normal P wave on this one. We have a normal QRS complex. But if you notice here, compare this with this normal T wave. This right here, we call this part right here the ST segment from this part here to this part here. It's the ST segment. And then we refer to this uh, from the beginning of the P wave to that Q. That's our PR interval, right? So here's our ST segment. I'll write that there, ST segment. And then this right here is our PR interval, right? PR interval looks good, but the ST segment looks like it's elevated. So we call this an ST segment elevation. Sometimes in hospitals, you'll hear it referred to as a STEMI, all right? And STEMI is short for saying ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And so you would see if someone has a ST segment elevation, it most likely is indicative of some type of myocardial infarction or a heart attack. But obviously you could do other diagnostic testings to prove that, all right? That's one of those differential diagnoses. Then over here, you'll notice in this one that there's a normal P wave, normal QRS complex, but then the T wave's flipped. It's inverted. So now there is a T wave inversion. So this one is a T wave inversion. Now T wave inversions are indicative, there is ST segment depressions. I didn't want to talk about that. Again, we'll talk about it in more detail later. But just simply, T wave inversions are usually indicative of ischemia. So they're usually indicative of ischemia. And ischemia just means that there is a decreased oxygen supply or lack of, a, a decreased uh, lack of blood flow to the myocardial tissue. And it's going to cause this negative deflection. This, again, that's a T wave inversion. Let's go over here to this one. So now we look at this guy. What do we notice? We notice a normal P wave. All right, then we notice the PR interval here. QRS complex, then we got our T wave. Then we go over here to our P wave, and then we notice that this there's our PR interval, QRS complex, T wave. Now the only way we'll be able to like determine why this is abnormal is if you actually look at the ECG paper. If you look at the ECG paper, there's little blocks that identifies the amount of time it takes. If the PR interval, normally the PR interval is about 160 to 200 milliseconds. If it's greater than that, then there's a prolonged PR interval. What happens in this one, and I obviously I'd, I'd need an ECG paper to see that, but there is actually going to be a prolonged PR interval right here. But it's consistent. All right? it's, not, it's not varying. It's a consistent prolonged PR interval. So let's say it's greater than 200. Let's say it's 220 milliseconds here. And then over here, this PR interval, even though it's not looking like it, it is 220 milliseconds also. If someone has consistent PR prolongation, PR interval prolongations, but it's not progressively getting longer, this is described to be what's called a first degree heart block, which are, are, are physiologically normal, okay? There's nothing really uh, designed to be, you know, this is not life-threatening, it's very common. Obviously, stress, anxiety, certain things can actually trigger this to happen. But it's not life-threatening, there's no need for a pacemaker or anything like that. All right, next one. If you look over here, we notice the PR interval is long, and then it actually looks like it's getting a little longer. And then eventually over here, you notice there goes T wave, P wave, whoa, no QRS wave. What happened there? So if we look again, what was I saying? Let's say that this PR interval, let's say it's 220 milliseconds. Then we come over here and this PR interval, let's say it's 240 milliseconds. So again, we have our T wave here, then we got our P wave, but look guys, no QRS complex. And then we go back to a P wave. This is referred to as a second degree heart block. And you can actually say this is called Mobitz 1 or Winkenbach. And how do you describe that? You say that the PR interval is getting progressively longer and then you drop a QRS interval, or a QRS wave, sorry. All right, so that is one thing to remember for a second degree heart block, Mobitz 1. Now, second degree heart block, Mobitz 1, is more common within some type of infranodal block. So there's a block usually within the AV node. We'll go into more detail of that in pathophys. But for right now, just remember, common cause of it is usually an infranodal block. Now, second degree Mobitz 1 can progress into Mobitz 2. And again, Mobitz 1 isn't super life-threatening, but it's obviously, you know, it's a partial heart block. Um, if we come over here, this is a little bit more, you know, dangerous. You've got to be careful with these ones. This is a second degree heart block, Mobitz 2. 
Now with second degree heart block MOBITs too, the PR interval is normal. So it's normal PR interval. It's not, it's not fluctuating, obviously I didn't show up perfectly there, but the PR interval is normal. It's not changing, it's not going from 220 to 240. It's a normal PR interval, but what you notice is, here's your P wave, PR interval, QRS wave, T wave, and then there's our P wave. But then if you notice what happened, we dropped our QRS complex. And then we go back to a P wave, and then we might have a QRS complex. So it's kind of like grouping them. And what it might look, these are kind of sometimes hard to differentiate a little bit, but with this one, the, the third degree heart block, which I'll talk about, it does have a varying PR interval. Whereas within the second degree heart block, MOBITS 2, the PR interval is usually normal. It's not changing, it's not fluctuating. But some of the P waves don't make it through. It doesn't get through the AV node and it doesn't go down to the ventricles. So the ventricles don't contract. That is important to remember. The P waves are going, but they're not making it through the AV node. They're not getting into the ventricles and the ventricles aren't contracting. So this is called second degree heart block, MOBITS 2. Okay, and just remember, normal PR interval, but it drops a QRS complex in there because some of the P waves don't get through. And again, uh, second degree heart blocks, um, some of the symptoms that you can see within these people are some syncope, some dizziness, and stuff like that too, okay? All right, let's come into this next one. This is a third degree heart block. And the third degree heart block, I've already kind of given you a little bit of information on that. We already know that they're going to have, sometimes you're gonna have this again, so P wave, QRS complex, so again P, QRS, T wave, P wave, and then you go back to a P wave. And then we got QRS complex, and then we go T wave, P wave, P wave again. This one is completely the worst one. This is a, th this is a complete heart block as you would describe it. So third degree heart blocks are very, very life threatening, very dangerous. You're going to need to give them a, a, most likely an artificial pacemaker. They actually definitely need an artificial pacemaker. But here's what's different from the second degree heart block. The ventricles and the atria beat on their own rate. So none of the impulses. Within the uh, MOBITS 2, some of the impulses from the uh, atria actually get down into the ventricles. Within third degree heart block, none of the impulses get through the AV node and down to the ventricles. The ventricles actually develop their own beating rate, and the atria beat at their own rate. So because of that, there is no connection, if you will, between the atria and the ventricle functioning as well anymore, okay? This is a third degree heart block. So the P and the QRS wave are not agreeing correctly, and they're beating at their own rate. All right, so that's the third guard block. All right, guys, so now we're gonna come down to my personal favorite, and this is gonna be an EKG that is indicative of what's called Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome. So I'm just gonna put WPW syndrome, okay? So again, this is called Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome. It's a congenital condition in which the individuals have an uh, irregular accessory pathway. And that accessory pathway is called the bundle of Kent, and it's actually bidirectional. So impulses can go through it down, anterior grade, and it can go up through it retrograde, which can create what's called re-entry. And it can lead to supraventricular tachycardia, which is, can be symptomatic and asymptomatic and stuff like that. Usually the way to treat this is they sometimes can do what's called uh, radio frequency catheter uh, ablation, where they hit this uh, bundle of Kent with radio frequency waves creating scar tissue so that it doesn't conduct the electrical potentials through it. Anyway, let's come back here and let's look here. We can see here, in this one, they don't really have a distinguishable P wave. So if they don't have a distinguishable P wave, it actually kind of just goes straight up. It looks like it's coming straight up right there. That's actually a distinct wave. This one right here, I'm gonna draw in blue. That's called a delta wave. And again, over here, you'll see this one. This is called a delta wave. So again, this is a delta wave here, and this is a delta wave here. And again, this is usually indicative of someone who has Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome. Because that's one of the big things to look for for this. There's obviously more and we'll talk about it in great detail in pathophysiology. Let's come over here and let's look at some more EKGs. So if we look here, you're going to see this one. And right away you see the sawtoothed like structures. These are supposed to be your P waves, but we, we don't call them P waves. We actually call them F waves. So this is a F wave. All these are F waves. All right, that's an F wave. And these sawtooth F waves, 
indicate that there's some P waves, they're just kind of like doing through this, they're going through this re-entry and then eventually some of those re-entries will hit the AV node and then send the action potentials down to the ventricles and then cause the ventricles to depolarize. And then again, you'll have your T wave and then you might have some more, again, re-entry circuits and then eventually some of those circuits will hit the AV node and send action potentials down. Atrial flutter is this condition again. This is called atrial flutter. It's not life-threatening, but it can progress um, and become very serious. Usually atrial flutter is caused by, could be due to myocardial infarctions or thyroid toxicosis like elevated T3 and T4, could be due to mitral valve prolapses, a whole bunch of reasons that we will talk about in the future. But uh, atrial flutter obviously is not completely serious, but it can progress. And sometimes it can progress into this one below it, which is called atrial fibrillation. And again, you'll notice in atrial fibrillation, you have these like, don't even really see a P wave. Then there's not distinct P waves. It's just kind of like this little squiggling almost around baseline activity to where there's no P waves present. It's just this kind of like irregular rhythm here. And that's one of the big things to notice here. They're not F, they're actually, they do have names, but it's, here's the biggest thing. They're F waves, but they're little F. So this is little F waves, little F waves. So they're both F waves, except this one up here in atrial flutter is capital F waves. These are lowercase f waves. So these lowercase f waves are indicative of atrial fibrillation. Okay, AFib, you got to be careful with. Obviously, you might have to. These could be due to metabolic syndrome, again, thyroid toxicosis, MIs, obesity. It can go on and on and on. And sometimes you might have to deal with this depending upon the condition. Again, you might have to do uh, radio frequency catheter ablation. You might have to do cardioversion, whatever it might be. We'll get into more detail into that in the future. So again, these are F waves, but remember they're lowercase F waves. And this is, this condition is called atrial fibrillation. Another danger with atrial fibrillation, I just wanted to mention really briefly, is that they don't really have functional contractions. And so the blood pools up a lot inside of the atria. And if there's stagnant flow, according to Virchow's triad, when there's a stasis of blood flow, there can be an increased chance of forming thrombi. And so sometimes these can form little vegetations on the, the valves, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, and get dislodged and go and cause an embolism, like a pulmonary or cerebral embolism. And again, we'll talk about these in more detail later. Next one right here, you're gonna notice something weird. And this is kind of more common in individuals who are uh, using drugs, like drug overdoses. You'll notice that the P wave changes. It takes on different morphological structures, at least three. So right here, it looks like it's kind of triangular shaped. Over here, it looks kind of like normal. And over here, it kind of looks like a little squiggled, right? Whenever you notice three different morphological P waves in sequence, it's referred to as what's called a wandering atrial pacemaker. Okay, and again, you'll notice that this is more common than like drug overdoses, but you'll notice that there's obviously three distinguishable or morphological P waves. Okay, it's a wandering atrial pacemaker. Over here, this is obviously common to someone who uh, uses nicotine or you know they drink a lot of caffeine or certain drugs and stuff like that. What can happen is they can have this little ectopic focus where they could trigger a premature ventricular contraction. So it might develop some irritable foci within the ventricles and it might contract before the P wave actually sends the impulses out. So you'll notice here, we go P wave, right? So we have a P wave, then we got our QRS wave, then we have our T wave, but we don't see the P wave. It kind of goes and actually bypasses the P wave because of a premature ventricular ectopic focus and it triggers a premature ventricular contraction. So it's indicative of this part right here. Okay, so this is indicative of PVCs, or premature ventricular contractions. Okay? And obviously this can be due to caffeine, it could be due to uh, possibly um, some type of nicotine, it could be due to exercise, a lot of common causes of this. Last one, all right, this, this guy's not having a good day. Uh, this is a really, really bad one. This is life-threatening, and it's actually called uh, torsades de points. Torsades de points, so torsades de points, or I think they even call it de ponce. It just refers to twisting of the points around the isoelectric line. 
This one's really, really life-threatening. Obviously, you're gonna need to treat this. It's a medical emergency. But with uh, torsades de points, it's usually referred to as a prolonged QT syndrome. And the most common causes of prolonged QT syndromes are actually metabolic reasons. In other words, more specifically, if someone has low magnesium levels within the blood or if they have uh, hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia, um, those are common causes and even medications can lead to those. So this is a really, really bad one. Obviously, this needs uh, medical attention immediately. So this kind of gives us just a brief overview. We'll get into a lot of these in more detail in the future. Um, but for right now, that gives us everything we need to know about EKGs.